Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, <coughs> this was a good presentation by Camille, very technical, very, uh, very rigorous. And uh, you can relax now because mine is going to be much more, much looser. Um, <coughs> the Moon and Mars. Uh, I decided about the Moon not to talk too much about uh, missions and about uh, the challenges of landing on the Moon and uh, uh, leaving the Moon, uh, whether it was in the Apollo program or what will follow, but I'll talk more about about people. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being an astronaut at the European Space Agency for many years, and I was in Houston for 25 years. And I got to know a lot of the people who went to the moon, and uh, I want to talk about people uh, for a while. Then I will talk about uh, the plans of the US to go back to the moon, because uh, we had news this morning that Americans plan to go back to the moon very soon. Um <coughs> So I just have a few selected moon facts and stories, and mainly about people. Uh, I like this picture. And uh, in the Swiss Space Center, many have seen this picture, because uh, when I saw it about two weeks ago, it was on the occasion of an uh, event of the Explorers Club in New York, March 17th. When I saw this picture, I was really, really amazed. Uh, this is a good fraction of the living Apollo astronauts. Uh, many of them have died already. Among the 12 moonwalkers, we only have four that are still alive. And uh, all of the Apollo astronauts now are between 80 and 90 years of age. But you have see here Charlie Duke, uh, Apollo 16, Buzz Aldrin. Uh, he's the only one who doesn't have a black uh, tuxedo. In fact, uh, he had a comment on Twitter saying that he didn't know that he was supposed to wear a black tuxedo for this <laughs> event. <laughs> and uh, he always has a special sock here, as you can see, the, the white and red uh, sock. Uh, then you have uh, Walt Cunningham. This is Apollo 7, which didn't go to the moon, but it was a testing of the lunar module on uh, orbit around the Earth. Uh, Al Warden, Apollo 15, he was a command uh <coughs> module pilot, didn't, didn't walk on the moon. Uh, Rusty Schweikart here. Um <coughs> Harrison Schmitz, who was uh, the first scientist uh, astronaut in the Apollo program. He was on Apollo 17. Uh, all the others were very bright and very talented test pilot, but this was a, a geologist. Uh, Mike uh, Collins was the uh, command and service module pilot on Apollo 11. So he's the one who waited for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, to come back, uh, rendezvous, on, uh, on orbit around uh, the moon. And this is uh, Fred Hayes, who was on Apollo 13. So out of these, uh, we had uh, two moonwalkers, these two here. Uh, the others were <coughs> either on a test missions of the Apollo program around the Earth, or they were uh, on the command and service module on orbit around the, the moon, waiting for their colleagues to come back. But that's a great picture. Um, these are giants. For me, as an astronaut, we always considered these as giants. And uh, we considered in the, Apollo in the shuttle program that I was part of that we were on the shoulder of giants, on the shoulder of people like this. Uh, this picture is very impressive for me. I hope it is for you, too. Um <coughs> now there's uh, one moonwalker missing, uh, Commander Dave Scott, uh, Apollo 15. And... Um, uh, he is here on uh, the third EVA of Apollo 15. Uh, Apollo 11, as you may know, had only one EVA. They stayed for about two hours on the moon surface, then went back to the um <coughs> lunar module and then uh, back rendezvous with uh, Mike Collins. But uh, on the later mission, Apollo 15, 16, 17, they had several spacewalks on the surface of the moon. And uh, in fact, this uh, video was supposed to start automatically. If it does not, somebody has to start it. Because uh, Dave Scott did uh, an experiment uh, to verify the law of falling bodies. Uh, he had a feather and, uh, and a hammer. And uh, as you know, with the law of falling bodies, when you let them from the same altitude above the moon surface or Earth's surface, they will hit the ground at the same time. Uh, can we start it? OK. I uh, checked it before and it did start, but anyway, uh, that's a pity because... So we cannot have it working? My videos will not work? 
Uh, I chose the mode automatic uh, starting, but it doesn't work here. It worked on my computer, but it doesn't work on this one. Oh, oh well. That's a pity, because the other one will not work either, right? Okay. Anyway, uh <coughs> now we would have Dave Scott coming from the right side <laughs> with a <laughs> with a feather and a hammer on his uh, two hands, and then he let them go, and they hit the ground at the same time. Uh, the law of falling bodies of Galileo. It's okay. We'll continue. Don't worry about it. Except you if you can get it within seconds, but <laughs> let all right. Let's continue. Uh <coughs> two other moonwalkers passed away last year, and they were really great individuals, and uh, one of them is uh, Albin. Um, I know him quite well, because when I started training as an astronaut, ESA astronaut at the Johnson Space Center in 1980, uh, he was uh, our class director for about five years. He was uh, just monitoring our training. He gave us advice about the uh, steps of training. A great individual, and uh, after his Apollo 12 flight, as a moonwalker, he became a painter, and a very talented painter. He did absolutely beautiful painting. And uh, I show you here what he did. This is a very well-known picture of Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11, picture taken by Neil Armstrong. Very well-known picture. And you see the reflection of uh, the photographer of uh, uh, Neil Armstrong uh, here. So this is Buzz Aldrin. And uh, ba <coughs> uh, Alan Bean, uh, made a painting representing Neil Armstrong with a camera when he took this picture. And here you have a reflection of Buzz Aldrin on the visor of the helmet <laughs> of uh, Neil Armstrong. I think it's beautiful, and you see how talented uh, Alan Bean was. And he was always using some tools and boots that had uh, been on the moon in order to give some uh, structure to, to, to his painting. So it's not only the painting, but you have some sculpture here. These are boots. Uh, moon boots, and uh, you see some traces here from an uh, uh, instrument they were using to take samples of, uh, uh, of the moon dust. So I like this uh, double picture of uh, this beautiful painting of, uh, uh, made by Albin on the right-hand side, just the other side of what you see on the left-hand side. Beautiful. Um, another moonwalker and really one of the best astronauts of the of the whole human spaceflight program that uh, have ever lived uh, john yang is here uh, he was he flew on gemini two times uh, he was a commander of apollo 16 together with uh, charlie duke they walked on the moon and he was the commander of the first shuttle flight uh, the 12th of april 1981 just 20 years after the the flight of yuri gagarin and you see him here, John Young. Uh, so he flew on the Gemini, on Apollo, and the first space shuttle mission, the space shuttle had never flown before unmanned, and he had the guts, the courage, of being the commander of that mission, a, a two-day mission of testing the space shuttle. And uh, he was there on this mission with uh, uh <coughs> uh, Bob Crippen. I'm very impressed with John Young. He was definitely one of the greatest astronauts that ever has lived and uh, operated spaceship uh, on orbit around the Earth and to the moon. Now, uh, this morning when I got up, I looked at the news, which I normally do. When I'm still in bed, I looked uh, at, at the news and I saw this. Uh, Le Vice President American, the American Vice President Mike Pence, uh, <coughs> announced uh, the day before yesterday that the United States is going to deploy all of the possible means to send back astronauts on the moon within the next five years. Within the next five years. And we had never heard that before. Uh, in the Obama time, the idea was for the Americans not to go back uh, to the moon because they had done this in a very bright manner in the 60s with the Apollo program, but to go to Mars, so rather the next step. But um, <coughs> with um, Donald Trump, Donald Trump said a couple of years ago, I want Americans back on the moon. So it was a redirection of the NASA activities to <laughs> prepare for uh, a return of people to the moon, but not that early. But I guess there's some urgency because uh, probably the Chinese are planning to do that and maybe other nations, I don't really know. Uh, but I saw this news this morning, and this is very new, within the next 
five years, which means uh, 2024, so they should have an American back on the moon. In the meanwhile, they had put a whole system with a gateway and a uh, complex spacecraft was going to be on orbit around the moon, and at some point they were going to attach a lunar module to the gateway, and the lunar module was going to separate. But this was going to take years and years, not just five years, but much more than that. So there is suddenly an urgency. And uh, this is another statement that I saw today. Uh, this is uh, by the NASA administrator, the new administrator. Today I spoke at the National Space Council where we discussed the need to accelerate our return to the moon. We will be taking action to accomplish this. And I know NASA is ready for the challenge of moving forward to the moon, this time to stay. The idea is to go back to the moon, but stay, unlike Apollo, where they were only uh, remaining for a few hours for the first mission and uh, up to three days for the last uh, Apollo missions. And uh, this is also a French here. Uh, the next uh, inhabited lunar mission is going to go be going to the to the south pole of the moon because we know there is uh, water ice in the poles of the moon, especially in the south pole. Um <coughs> uh, and uh, the idea is a preparation for future missions to Mars, which should be done in the middle of the 30s. This is NASA's point of view. It looks like SpaceX is going to be able to go there earlier than that, but uh, NASA has a plan for Mars in the mid 30s. Uh, <coughs> that's what I just mentioned. Uh, well, uh, SpaceX, a uh, private company, very successful, led by Elon Musk, uh, on one hand is planning to colonize the, the, uh, the planet Mars at some point, and he also uh, 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 has the plan to send a tourist, uh, not on orbit around the moon, but to the moon and back, just go around the moon and back, uh, pretty soon using his... Uh, New rocket, which was uh, called a BFR, but now it's called uh, uh, the Star Starship, which is still not tested. But uh, the announced time is 2023, and this is really a quick time. When you think about it, the rocket, which is completely new, had not been tested to take a tourist around the moon and back uh, with this rocket. I don't know whether it will really happen. This is a tourist. This is the announcement that was done a few months ago, and uh, this is the, the tourist. Uh, Yusaku Maezawa, he's a rock star in uh, Japan, and he planned, he, he's paying a lot for this. It's not revealed, but it's probably a, a few hundreds of million of dollars uh, uh, to do that, uh, which is good for SpaceX. Uh, it will help SpaceX. And some people have a lot of money, and they, they pay this money, and it helps in the uh, development of uh, capabilities uh, to go to faraway targets in the solar system. And he plans uh, not to go alone, but to take a few artists and uh, friends with him. And maybe he will even take astronauts with him. This is not known <laughs> yet. Uh, that's the <coughs> SpaceX uh, BFR. This is the old uh, designation, uh <coughs> the Big Falcon rocket. But now there's a better name, Starship, I think is a better name. And this is what will happen. But just go around the moon and come back uh, without going on orbit around the moon and even less to land on the moon. And <laughs> I saw this on the internet and I find it interesting. This is the uh, Starship that is being assembled in Texas. And uh, it looks like an old-fashioned rocket here. And uh, near that you have a motorbike with some people. Uh, this, this doesn't seem to be the style uh, very similar to what NASA is uh, uh, is doing. It's, it's we are not accustomed to that kind of uh, that kind of view, but uh, it's a different style. But Elon Musk and SpaceX are very successful, respectively, person and uh, company, and I'm sure they'll be successful also in uh, their uh, ventures toward uh, the Moon and Mars. But uh, this is a rather starting picture here. Looks like from another time, but this was taken a few a few weeks ago only. They are soon going to be testing in Texas uh, their new rockets, the Starship. Okay, um, that's what I would just say about uh, about people and about uh, the plans of uh, uh, NASA and uh, and SpaceX uh, to go to the Moon and Mars. And uh, I just wanted to show this interesting picture of the Moon. This is the near side of the Moon, the the side that we always see, and this is the far side of the Moon, which you have never seen. Very few people have seen that. Um, and it's interesting to see the big difference. Uh, there are a lot of the so-called seas. This is a sea of tranquility. Excuse me, here, the sea of tranquility. 
and a lot of other seas on the other side, uh, there are no, s no, uh, no such uh, lava uh, <coughs> regions. Uh, these seas on the near side of the moon are lava uh, plains. And it's interesting to see that, uh, that asymmetry of the moon. The moon, of course, is not exactly spherical. It's a little bit uh, uh, um, elongated along a direction which is uh, the line between the center of the Earth and the center of the moon. That's the reason why, finally, it was locked uh, so that we always see the same face of the moon. Um, but it's interesting to see the difference here. And uh, this is... Uh, a uh, half moon, and you see again the sea of tranquility here, and uh, you can see these features very well with the naked eye. So next time you see the moon between, uh, I would say, the half moon which you have here and the full moon, which you see here, uh, please pay attention to this sea here, which is the sea of tranquility where Apollo 11 landed. And obviously they chose this region because it's relatively flat. A later mission landed in areas which are a little more rugged and with craters and mountains. But pay attention to that. You can see very well this feature with the naked eye here, Sea of Tranquility. And uh, that's the last picture I wanted to show about the, the moon part of my, my talk. This beautiful picture taken with a, uh, by a Japanese spacecraft. It's not the, in the Apollo program, but the Japanese spacecraft is relatively recent. You see in the foreground the uh, landscape of the moon. In the background you see planet Earth a distance of about 400,000 kilometers, a beautiful sight. Um, I say a few words about Mars. Mars is more friendly. Uh, the moon is, of course, very dry, absolutely zero atmosphere. And uh, the day is very long and the night very long on the moon. That's the reason why it's better to go to the poles, where you can have either, if you go out of a crater, you can see the sun. If you go inside the crater, you're in, the in, the in darkness. But if you are close to the equator, the day lasts 14 of our days and the night 14 of our nights, 14 times 24 hours. And uh, that's, that's, that's a very long night time. The temperature drops to a very, very low value. So <coughs> uh, if we want to stay a long time on, a, uh <coughs> on, a, on the moon, it's better to go to the, to the pole here. Uh, Mars is much more uh, friendly, but it is far away. This is a picture of, uh, of Mars taken uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. Pretty sharp picture, although obviously you have much sharper picture taken from a spacecraft which are on orbit around the red planet. For instance, Mars Express. Uh, Mars is basically a desert, except that you have uh, uh, dry ice with frozen CO2 and frozen uh, uh, water. Uh, on the poles, but uh, the equatorial region and med medium latitude regions are pretty much like desert. But there was flowing water in the past. Clearly, there was liquid water. These are uh, former uh, uh, riverbeds uh, showing the presence of liquid water in the past. Um, the plan is to send uh, humans to Mars. Again, uh, NASA plans to do it only in the mid 30s and maybe 40s. SpaceX would like to do this before. Um, this is a picture out of the movie uh, The Martian. And uh, uh, travel to Mars is finally not that difficult. The, the major challenge is really to live on Mars and to live from the land. Unlike the moon, where you can take everything from the Earth to live for a few days or a few weeks, even uh, on, th on the moon, it's very close to the Earth. On Mars, you need to plan to live from uh, the resources of uh, planet Mars which is quite difficult. I'm not going to go into the detail of that. In fact, there are some very good uh, presentation. There is one by uh, Stephen uh, Petranek. This is a uh, YouTube uh, link uh, that has a very good presentation about the challenge of going to Mars on one hand, but especially to live from the resources of planet Mars. Now, one idea is uh, if someday we want to be to stay on Mars for a very long time, uh, you don't want to have to wear a spacesuit whenever you want to go out of the of the your residence, which is probably going to be underground on Mars, like on lava tubes, to be protected against radiation. Uh, what you would like to do at some point, and it's very difficult, but it's not completely impossible, is to do so-called terraforming of Mars. Slowly, little by little, over decades and centuries, uh, transform the atmosphere of Mars and the surface of Mars so that it becomes more like the Earth. So this is Mars like it is now, and these are steps in terraforming which could take centuries or maybe millennia, possibly. 
And uh, there's an interesting game that has been uh, made by Alexis Girard. I learned about that uh, in a meeting of the Mass Society, um, the Swiss uh, part of the Mass Society, uh, last Friday, so pretty recently in Neuchâtel. And I met with Alexis Girard, and I have a small video clip, I hope it will work, where he will explain his game of terraforming Mars. Can you help me? <laughs> it worked on my computer, but oh, yeah. It doesn't work? Okay. So, well, anyway, uh, maybe you can. Uh, yeah, I can give you the link because it's a very interesting, interesting link. And he's explaining how we can play. It's a game in the sense that you can change a lot of parameters. You can add uh, oxygen, you can add nitrogen, you can change also the radiation from the sun. And this could be done artificially with having big mirrors uh, on orbit around Mars in order to beam an extra source of uh, uh, light from the sun on uh, areas of dry ice, which is frozen CO2 in order to vaporize uh, this uh, material. And if you have CO2, if you add CO2 in the Martian atmosphere, which is very thin, and very low pressure, then you increase the amount of CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, and you have a way of warming up mass and little by little over decades and centuries, uh, make it more habitable, and at some point even possibly having a breathable atmosphere. Anyway, sorry it doesn't work, but uh, this is a picture I took uh, the International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide in September 2017. This is <laughs> Elon Musk uh, talking about his, at that time, he was still talking about the BFR rocket, now it's a Starship. And uh, look at this here. Uh, this is typical Elon Musk. He thinks that humanity should at some point become a multi-planet species. He wants to have humanity spread in the solar system. Uh, to Mars first, to the Moon and Mars, but also beyond planet Mars. Uh, whether he will succeed or not, we will see. But uh, Elon Musk is a very talented person. His company is very successful, and I'm sure he will have uh, some success in this direction, not within the next few years or decade, but at some point the next century or so. Okay, have fun now. There's also music in the background here, but it looks like it doesn't work either. No, it's uh, during that. Oh, well. So sorry for the partial failure of this presentation. Uh, no video clip and, uh, and no sound. OK, well, this is something I didn't plan to, to, to show. But this is a landing of uh, the small Chinese spacecraft that landed uh, a couple of months ago on the far side of the moon. And uh, this is an image relayed by a satellite that was on the L2 Lagrange point of the Earth moon system, and you see here, controlled by uh, people in uh, China, the landing of that spacecraft. You see it's going to be pretty hard uh, impact at the end. Here they hesitate about location, let go, the last approach, and bang! Okay, it is not a very soft landing, but it worked. Thank you very much. Sorry for the, the problem with the other video clips. I don't know why I didn't.